<laughs> this is funny. I call it my God wants to get up close and personal with you. No, but seriously, you know, I was uh, looking at this devotional earlier, Tozer, and I read it, you know, and I kind of went, okay, I got it, you know, and I kind of do like I always do. I just kind of look at the title, maybe, and kind of skim it a little bit, you know, and then go, okay, Lord, it's your spirit, whatever you want to say, go for it, man. I'm just here to listen, you know, and talk what you want us to be so spoken. So I went, okay. And I went babbling for a while and talking and sharing, and I was kind of like, yeah, and I was like, yeah, this and yeah, that and okay, and then talked about that, and then talked about this, and talked about that. Then it kind of went, you know, <laughs> somewhere like left field and right field and climbed over the fence, you know, and kind of walked down the street and left the ballpark. <laughs> I just kind of went out to lunch, so to speak, and uh, it was interesting, you know, I just went, okay, we're just going to delete that one and Skip it. <laughs> so now we're back to it. And it's Dozer. But I had already recorded just now, um, right before doing this one, I recorded uh, my utmost, which sometimes God just does that to me. He lets me just kind of like ramble and bamble, you know, without his spirit really inspiring, until he gets me to do it in order so that my mind has been brought into the framework of his. That I don't know if you understand this, but, you know, we are to put on the mind of Christ. You know, it's that the way we do that is that our spirit needs to be brought in alignment with his spirit. And that how that is accomplished is through his word. But see, you could really pick and choose anything you want to from the Bible. I mean, literally. You can make yourself into a, a religious legalist, you know, from the Bible. And you'd be biblically correct, depending upon how far you read in the Bible, if you only limit yourself to certain parts of it. You could make yourself into a, a grace face, you know, and literally make everything rosy and hunky-dory and no hell and only heaven, you know, like some people are doing, by just limiting yourself and not going into all of the scriptures. But it is in the Bible, and you could quote hundreds of scriptures, and some people would be impressed with that. See, right now... There's a lot of people that are impressed if you quote the scripture chapter and verse. But what I do is I want you to think about it. Because anyone can quote any scripture at any time out of context. And if you're not thinking, you'll be deceived completely. So it's in the volume of the book from Genesis to Revelation that we draw from the sustenance of God. But putting on the mind of Christ, now that's different. That's kind of putting on like your thinking cap. Kind of like they used to say in Romper Room, you know. And I don't even know because I didn't watch Romper Room. But you had to put on some kind of cap, I think. Or maybe that was Mr. Green Jeans or something. Or Captain Kangaroo. Now that I watched, but I don't remember it very well. At least I don't think I remember it very well. Anyways, someplace you had to put on your thinking cap. And... uh that's kind of what I like to tell people. Is like, you know, when you put on the mind of Christ, you kind of got to get a framework here, you know, in your brain. You can't just let your thoughts go crazy. You have to kind of control them. And the framework is one of God is love. That's the baseline. And then you have to kind of build this structure that's, you know, based upon love and grace, you know, and mercy, or grace and mercy, which kind of goes upward. So, when I say that your framework has to be right, I'm always saying you have to think of it in perspective of, God is love, you have to love your enemies, and you have to love your friends. So, pardon me, but sounds like God is love, and you got to love everybody. I think that's what Jesus said. But then people like to try to take the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' own words, and because they want to kill somebody, they say, well, you know, we got to have capital punishment, so let's not get too carried away about this. You can love your enemies by, it's okay to have authorities in charge that have the scepter, even though the scepter's been removed. I wonder who owns the scepter. I wonder who's been given to. I wonder who possesses it. I wonder who is the righteous judge who can judge the hearts of men rather than the outward manifestations of what he's doing. 
Hmm, we don't talk about the scepter. We talk about our rights to judge each other and to kill each other. We have wars, righteous wars, godly wars. We have violence. We can do violence, man. Oh, man, is it fun to do violence? I love it, man. I got Warcraft. I got Battlefield. I think it's Battlefield. Battle whatever, three. Warfare three. Guns and Roses or whatever. <laughs> Something that makes me, oh man, I get to kill violent nature, contrary to peace, opposite of love, the difference from joy. Now you see, there's this part of everyone that says, yeah, but we don't want to be so spiritually minded, we're no earthly good. So we have to have all these rules and laws and regulations in order to kill somebody. Because we want to send them eternity and make sure they spend eternity in hell. And then we begin to look like them. And then we begin to act like them. And the interesting thing is I always find that the first time you kill something or someone, have you ever noticed you're never the same? Sounds like the shedding of blood, the spilling of blood, has an eternal effect on you. It seems like God said the earth cries out from the blood of your brother. The earth, the world, created by God, the dust from which you came cries out because of the blood that was shed by one man. So I wonder what happens when we kill. But you gotta eat. You gotta protect yourself. I mean, after all, you didn't, you know, if somebody broke into your house, what would happen then? God won't protect you. God won't take care of you. God doesn't do that. He put people in charge for that. I wonder, when Elisha was sitting and laying in bed, was he an example of a born-again Christian, the way we should live? Or was he an exception to the rule? Do you know about Elisha? Oh, you don't. Oh, well, you see, his servant kept coming up to him and saying, Elisha, Elisha, watch out, man. They're sending an army to come get you. They want you to do and meet with the king and they're going to come and kill you. And Elisha says, let them come. So, here's Elijah laying there in bed and he says, knock on the door. Elijah goes, what? He says, Elijah, come down. He says, Excuse me? He says, Elijah, man of God, come down. He says, well, I'm a man of God then. God send down fire and consume you. Poof! They toast. But we should have called our own army together first and protected ourselves. At least that's what Elisha's servant thought. So, Elisha goes down and sweeps up the mess, you know, and buries the dust. So then, here comes another, another cohort, so to speak. Another bunch of people come up and start knocking on his door and say, uh, Elijah, I, I, I know you're a man of God. And I know that we, you know, sent this army to come get you, but we want you to come down. And Elijah says, no. And since I am a man of God, get him, God. They history. So finally, you know, in the end, another guy comes up and says, Elijah, look, I'm a man, and I, you're a man, you know, and hey, I got family, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, I really don't want to do this, you know, and, you know, I know you got this thing going with God, you know, and you kind of like, you know, connected. So, 
if you would, please, you know, if you would think about it, you know, and if you don't want to, hey, it's okay by me, but please come down, you know, and go with me and, you know, we'll just go talk to him, you know, and see what he has to say. How's that, you know? Would you please consider that? And I says, okay, I'll go. So you see, at some point in time, you either have a complete trust in God that he can protect you, or you don't. Now, it's kind of an interesting story, is even later on, you know, that after he talked to this king and taking care of all that business, this servant of Elijah, you know, comes up and kind of shakes him and tries to wake him out of his bed. And Elijah says, what do you want now? And the guy says, hey, you know what? There's a whole bunch of Syrians out there, man. They're, they're getting ready to attack us. Man, we got to do something. And so Elijah says, look, you know, I'm tired of this. God, open his eyes. You know, just leave me alone. God, you open his eyes. And so the servant goes out there, and his eyes are open, and he sees all these angels standing behind the Syrians with fiery swords, ready to kill them. And the servant goes, I don't believe in capital punishment anymore. Now, you can take that story and leave it, if you want to. Like I told you at the beginning of this, you can take what you want out of Scripture and create for yourself your own doctrine, your own theology, your own ideas about God. But what if God is real? What if there are miracles happening you haven't seen yet? What if there are men of God? People that have a relationship with Jesus that are experiencing things that you have no idea about. Wouldn't you want to be one with your father in such a way that you could lay there like Elijah and trust him every day to do accordingly what he would do? That he would love you so much that he would even acknowledge what you say and cause it to come to pass? Man, if I could find a God like that, I'd think he was like king of the universe. I would think that he wanted us to I'd do anything he had to say. Like love your enemies. I'm not that. I don't want to do that. I mean, come on now. I mean, you don't want me to, like, care, do you? I mean, let's be real. These are sinners out there. They're disgusting. They're horrible. Why would I want to be like that? Maybe being like Elijah isn't all it's cracked up to be. Maybe I could just be like Tebow, some football player that if I could succeed in what I want to do, I could turn it over and say, God made me a winner. Of course, if you wind up losing, Are you still a winner? Do you still have a relationship with God? <laughs> or is your relationship with God dependent upon your winning? Well, we love reading Tebow while he's winning. He's a man of God. It's a miracle of God that he wins. I think that it's a miracle of God when he loses. But that's just me. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you are right and you have your own little take on the scriptures and the Bible and you have your own way of looking at it. Maybe. Losing God amid the wonders of his word to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Conformed to the image of Elijah? I want to be like Elijah. Can I be like Moses? Can I tell people what to do? Can I be a legalist? I want to be like Paul, you know. I want to argue a lot. And I want to tell people what's wrong and what's right, you know, and show them that, guess what? You know, I got the answer to grace them all. I want to be like Peter, you know. I kind of want to mess up at times, you know. Sometimes get it right, sometimes get it wrong. Conformed to the image of his son. If I said to you, what does it mean to be conformed to the image of his son? Or to be conformed to be exactly like his son? 
Does that mean you would have to love like he loved? Does that mean that you would have to do like he did? Does that mean you get to interpret what you want? Or does it mean it's the Father you do what he shows you to do? As Jesus said, he only did those things he saw his Father doing. Hmm. Maybe we should avoid reading Tozer, because after all, he lived in our generation. He seemed to have a handle on what excuses we have. The doctrine of justification by faith, a biblical truth, and a blessed relief from sterile legalism and unavailing self-effort has in our time fallen into evil company and been interpreted by many in such a manner as actually to bar men and women by many in such a manner as actually to bar men and women from the knowledge of God himself. The whole transaction of religious conversion has been made mechanical and spiritless. Faith may now be exercised without a jar to the moral life and without embarrassment to the Adamic ego. Christ may be received without creating any special love for him in the soul of the receiver. They do not have to love the one that they are accepting into their life. And then they don't have to do any of what the one they're accepting into their life as Lord has told them to do. Christ may be received without creating anything special, but that man then is, quote, saved, but he is not hungry or thirsty after God. He has no desire for the godly things. He has no want to know Jesus more, but rather just to avoid being sent to hell. The modern scientist has lost God amid the wonders of this world. We Christians are in real danger of losing God amid the wonders of his word. We have almost forgotten that God is a person and requires a relationship, not a demonstration of faith. God as a person can be cultivated as any person can. We should grow in a relationship, learning day by day to become closer and more attuned to hearing his voice and not just reading his word. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they would not follow the voice of another. God is a person and in the deep of his mighty nature, he thinks he wills, he enjoys, he feels, he loves, he desires, and he suffers as any other person may or might. In making himself known to us, he stays by the familiar pattern of personality. He has a personality that you could know. Religion so far as it is genuine is in essence the response of created personalities to the creating personality God himself and so this is life eternal that they might know you the only true God and Jesus Christ who now has sent not know by faith not know by works not know by righteousness but know by experiencing him and talking to him and having a relationship with him that they may know him, that you might know God. Isn't that awesome? First of all, that you can. And then that's what eternal life is all about. That you might know him. Even, not only God our Father, but Jesus and the Spirit too. Guess what? That is what salvation is coming to a place of personally, individually, knowing Him, hearing Him, loving Him, talking to Him, walking with Him, hugging Him, even worshiping Him, and yes, I'm going to say it, hearing His voice.